Okay, good afternoon, folks. Let's uh, let's get going. So this is lecture number 20. Uh, we're certainly in getting in the home stretch here. Uh, five more meetings after today. Um, I'm going to introduce a, a lab assignment number five. That's the last assignment. And um, I'm aware that it has a, a bit of an overlap, uh, a day of overlap with lab assignment number four. So let me just tell you a few things about lab number four. That, that of course being due tomorrow at a minute before um, uh, midnight. So you you will have found that the coding for lab assignment four is is pretty minimal uh, as long as you are able to make use of the examples that I gave you in in class. And I I did have uh, at office hours uh, a student that asked me, you know, hey, this lab number four it looks suspiciously simple in comparison to lab number three. So am I kind of interpreting it the wrong way, the person asked? And I said, no, it's, you know, the idea behind lab, lab number four uh, was was to, to give you a chance to practice using a timer, because these timers are important, um, without needing to do a whole lot of coding, without a whole lot of, of complexity. But of course, the big, the big new in lab number four is that you're building the whole thing with a bare uh, chip on your breadboard and you have to have the clock and all those pieces there. So that was the big change is coming off of the Arduino and building this thing on the breadboard. Um, and uh, so that's why the, the, the amount of coding that you had to do was relatively um, minor for lab number uh, four. Um, now, getting into lab number five, uh, what we're going to be doing is building an ultrasound measuring system. And uh, here's a, a picture of it. Oh, let me let me just say this about lab number four. Uh, so during the Q&A period uh, last week, I only had a handful of people who showed up and asked questions. And so um, it wasn't even substantial enough for me to produce a recording and post it. That's why there is no... Uh, set of slides and no recording for um, uh, lecture number 20, which was the Q&A for lab number four. Okay, so that's why if you're if you're looking for it, there is no there is no recording for that. Um, okay, so on to lab uh, five, and what we're going to be doing from here on out is showing you how to use the infrasound sensor uh, to measure distance, and uh, you know that's let's just get this pen working here. Uh, that, of course, is this device right here, which is in your kit. Now, um, there's quite a bit to this lab. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of pieces to it, and I'm going to I'm going to show you a block diagram and kind of walk you through much of it today, and then we'll build on it on Monday, and then a little bit more on Wednesday of next week. Um, you will um, you may recall that at the beginning of the semester we said that we would drop the lowest of your labs, and so you have five labs during the semester, and so I'm going to drop the lowest grade of those five. Um, if you're tempted to not do this one because it's a little more complicated, um, I'll just tell you two things. One, uh, this one. I'll tell you three things about it. Um, one is this one, you won't find this to be as frustrating a lab as number three, where you had to build the A to D converter and you had to do all those blinking uh, digits and you had to get all that uh, timing right to take advantage of retinal persistence. So that had a lot of frustrations. This won't have the same degree of frustration. So that's point number one. Point number two is you'll find this lab to be a very satisfying lab when you get it all working. Um, it'll be really a thing that you can have in your hand, walk around with it because it'll be powered by a battery, and it'll really be able to do something significant uh, and, and practical. So you'll find it to be a very satisfying lab in that sense. Uh, but point three, if you're tempted to not do this one because you did well on the other labs, I mean, that is understandable. When you do get into junior design project a year from now, uh, I teach that course, and we will be making use of the sonar sensor. And so you don't want to be in a situation a year from now where you're building a system 
where you have to code the sonar sensor and make use of the timers. And you say, gee, I kind of blew that part off in 231, and now how do I do it? It's, a, it's not a situation you really want to be in. So I would encourage you to stick with this one and make it work for all those reasons that I just discussed. Um, OK, what is lab number five? Here it is. It's to uh, implement a battery-operated distance measuring system using the ultrasound device in your kit. And I did post the actual uh, uh, detailed and more carefully written assignment today to this week's Moodle tab. But basically, you want to measure ob object distance between 0 and uh, 200 centimeters. If you want to go beyond 200 centimeters, that's up to you. But this is the requirement is to go up to 2 meters. And then you want to continuously display distance to the object uh, using the little organic LED display that you have in your kit. And then you also want to admit an audible tone uh, it, that's indicative of distance. And it'll be at a frequency that's proportional to distance. And you can choose the frequency. But the idea is that uh, uh, you want that frequency to, you know, to change uh, with, uh, with distance. All, all of the, the specifications are given in greater detail and precision in the, uh, in, in the handout that's, that you'll find on Moodle. Okay, but basically the idea is make it battery operated, uh, the, make a chip on the breadboard, and um, you got the sonar and you're walking around shining in at things, and it's giving you both a visual and an audible indication of how far away an object is. Um, and I thought it'd be helpful to just take a look at the various pieces of this system. Uh, the, you know, so I'm calling these the hardware components and the subsystems, but sort of all the all the individual pieces and just let's just walk through them. So obviously we need the 328P and that's going to be on a breadboard. I didn't actually show the breadboard as a component here, but let's so let's say that that's understood. OK, now to make this thing be portable, you're going to be using a nine volt battery and you're going to be using a voltage regulator. And the, the hookup for that is very straightforward. Um, you're probably going to be using a 16 megahertz external oscillator with 22 picofarad capacitors, unless you decided that you want to keep the chip running at one megahertz, and that's fine. You can do that, it, except that the the timing for the demo codes is based on a 16 megahertz oscillator. Okay, uh, you've got the infrasound sensor. And so uh, that's the sensing side. And then on the response side, you know, we think about these systems often, these embedded systems as sense and response systems. So the sense, you're sensing something about the environment, that's the infrasound sensor. And the response side is, you know, that's where the people are. What's this doing in response? So we'll have the organic LED display, and that's the little display you've got in your, in your kit um, showing, that'll show range in centimeters and in inches. And then we also have the, piezoelectric speaker okay now how are we getting code onto the chip well you're going to have uh, of course you have your host computer and that's where you're building your code right you're writing the code there and then to get the code onto the chip you're using this pocket programmer the avr pocket programmer and you connect that to the 328p using this specific six wire interface called the spy spi interface which just it's just this collection of miso mosi system clock ground a uh, reset and vcc it's just the specific way that you wire up the pocket programmer to the chip itself that's the uh, the spy interface or you may some of you have, may have chosen to use the ic I, icsp socket i'm going to go back and show you all this on the previous slide um now, for debugging this, uh, you'll 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 want to do this. It won't be required, but I strongly suggest that you set up uh, the ability to send serial data to your host computer using, uh, you know, ter terminal emulator software. Um, and so, I'm going to show you in the next few slides how to use the FTDI, which is a serial to USB interface. So, those are all the the bits of of hardware. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you another way of, a way of looking at the software next, and then I'll go back and show you a picture of, the, of, of my demo system that doesn't have all of this. But OK, in terms of the software system, um, and here, I'm not being very formal about this. I just wanted to sort of look at the big chunks of software that we need. So we're going to need 
some software that operates the infrasound. And so maybe what we'll do is we'll have software that will it'll go out and get an object distance. So I'll write it as a subroutine or, you know, or as a function. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll give it a name like get distance. We have the OLED display. And it turns out to use that display, you need to use some library code. And I'm going to show you on Monday how to how to do that. Um, you know, with, with the peripherals that we've been dealing with so far, the analog to digital converter, the UART, and the timers and GPIO, we always got uh, kind of down and dirty with the registers. And we really program things at, at very low level. Um, but, but let me let's see let me let me let me come back to this idea i just want to say i want to i want to just say the word library here and i want to contrast what it means to program something at low level versus versus uh, operating at a higher level i want to take a look at the uart so so far every time uh, i've used the uart i've made use of uh, a, a, a what amounts to a library of three functions that i made uart init initializes the UART, UART send, sends a character, and UART string. And I encourage you to go ahead and use those functions that I made. Um, and so if you use the U, these functions, then you don't really have to think about the, the gritty details of the UART. You just sort of use these functions, and as long as you use them the right way, the UART happily sends your characters out to the serial monitor. Um, well, we're, we're going to do the same thing when we introduce the organic LED. I'm going to give you a library that you can use, and you'll be able to deal with that organic LED just by giving it a set of high-level commands that invoke some functions. Uh, so rather than having to get down in detail at register-level detail with the OLED, the way we've had to do with the timer and the analog to digital converter, we're going to work with a, a bunch of libraries or a, a library of, of, uh, of functions. So more on that on Monday. Um, what else? OK, we need to have an audible tone that's generating a frequency. So this is the code that we have to kind of create uh, and, uh, and you know put together for this, for this application. Of course, what else do we need? Uh, it, for debugging, you, know, you, you need a terminal app. right? That's either PuTTY for Windows or it's terminal for the Mac users. We know we're using Visual Studio Code. That's a software subsystem. We don't have to build it, but we're using it. And then, of course, we're using a make file, and we're using the function called make. So this is all the software we have to deal with for this for this system. And um, I, I like the word system here. You know, this course is an introduction to embedded systems. And so uh, a system is a collection of of interconnected components or subsystems that accomplish a task. And so this very last project that you're working on is a, is a nice example of a, a system that has a lot of different pieces to it. So back to this picture here, what have we got on here? Well, obviously we've got our chip, right? And I've, I've got my, my time base. It comes from a 16 megahertz oscillator and those two capacitors. And you need both of those things together to give you the clean 16 megahertz. Okay, uh, right now um, I'm powering this using the five volts that comes from this pocket programmer that actually provides five volts. But um, I also do have my voltage regulator hooked up. And when I pull away the pocket programmer, I would just hook up a nine volt battery to that, to that voltage regulator. I like to have an LED that glows whenever the board has power. So that's the purpose of that. Okay, um, you, you know, you've got this ribbon cable here and uh, that has our spy uh, serial uh, peripheral interface. That's the, the MISO, the MOSI, the system clock, the reset, VCC and ground. And I'm using this socket here and I can just pull that off uh, to disconnect the cable and I leave all the wires already there on the board. The thing that's new that I'm going to introduce right now is this. This is our serial to USB converter. And what I'm doing is I'm taking this line here. That's the serial transmit line. And I, all I need is that and this black wire, which is ground. And that's those are the only two wires I need to get a serial connection so I can send uh, data off to my laptop uh, for debugging. Okay, so the system that you're going to build 
Uh, what, how, will, how will it be different from what's shown here? I mean, ultimately, you know, you'll use this stuff on the right for coding and debugging. That is for, you know, for flashing code and for debugging. But when it's all done, you pull that away. You power it with a, a nine volt battery into the regulator. Uh, there's a piezoelectric oscillator, uh, that piezoelectric speaker that has to go on there. And then also the little OLED display. Um, and when I built up the whole thing, I found I couldn't fit everything on one of these medium sized breadboards. So I, I decided, well, should I pull all this apart and put it on a big breadboard or just have two medium sized breadboards side by side? And it's the latter that I chose to do. So you can't quite fit everything on one of these these medium breadboards. OK, um, so let's 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 talk about this device here. Uh, that is because we haven't used that yet. It's in your kit. And uh, that's the device that, well, before I do that, let me just remind you about schedule. Okay, so um, so where are we right now? We are here. Um, it's, it's Wednesday, uh, April 20th, and I'm just assigning Lab 5. And Lab 5 is going to be due two weeks from tomorrow. So it'll be due the day after the last day of classes. So the last day of classes is May 4th, and, and, and so this will be due on, on uh, May 5th at 11.59 p.m., okay? Um, and then just so you'll see the remaining context, on Monday we're going to talk about that organic LED. I'm also going to show you how to use interrupts. Uh, well, and then we're almost done with the class at that point, but I, I'm going to show you, we'll do about half a class on, on Wednesday the 27th. I'll show you something about external triggers. And then we'll have a day for Q&A for Lab 5. And our very last class will be a review of the semester. OK. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's, let's review uh, the idea of using PuTTY or using a terminal uh, as a way of debugging, you know, sending information to your host computer so that you can test out whether things are working. And you'll find this is going to be, you know, you may you use this when you you did this when you built your A to D converter. You're going to find this really useful when you are um, hooking up your sonar. You've got your sonar; it's measuring stuff, and you're going to want to have that information being displayed on the organic LED and and hear it in a in a tone generated by the piezo speaker. But the question is: Is the data coming out of the sonar any good? Does it make any sense? First thing is send it to the serial monitor. Just send those characters out and see what they look like. And so uh, as a debugging trick. So how do we do that? Well, you, you've done this. Everything that's on here, this is just a review from when we talked about the UART. And you may recall that on the Arduino board, there's a little device on there which accomplishes serial to uh, USB converter. That is, it takes the, the transmitter and receiver pins from the Atmega chip, formats them as USB so you can plug it into the USB port of a computer. We're not using the Arduino board, so you're going to use one of these devices instead. You've got a bare chip, and what we're going to do is connect that with this. It's called an FTDI Basic from SparkFun. I don't actually remember what FTDI stands for. It's a, it's there. It's a proprietary chip that accomplishes serial to USB conversion. And so um, everything is going to be the same all the software everything is the same as when you use the arduino it's just that you need this little device to take your serial data coming out of the chip and format it for usb on your computer now this is a three wire interface it's got it's got ground right that's the black wire and then it has a transmitter and receive wire um all you all we're doing is we're transmitting signals from the atmega chip uh to the laptop we're not actually receiving so you, your this is your transmit line here no t t x d transmit data and that's going to go to rxi re to to receive on this side because you're you're transmitting from the at mega chip and then you're receiving on this side so make sure that you 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 go from transmit and to receive on this chip and then that data gets pushed out over usb so you just need the black wire, the ground wire, and then that transmit wire, OK? Um, now, this device, like a lot of things that you have, uh, has some drivers that you'll have to 
most likely have to install if you're using Windows. And so here is the Spark Fun. Uh, they're, they're the vendor we bought it from. Uh, there's the model number for the device. Um, and this is the page that describes this uh, little chip or this little board. Um, and if you're running Windows, there is a driver that you'll most likely have to install. And Spark Fun has a page on how to install the drivers, right? If you're using Windows or if you're using Mac or you're using Linux, um, it turns out on Mac, I didn't need to install a driver, um, but on, on Windows, uh, uh, I did. Uh, and you will likely need to also. So um, just that's where you look to install that driver. Now, uh, I just want to show you this thing in use. OK, uh, what I've done is I um, I'm, I'm going to show you a little movie here um, where and, and, and I'm, I apologize, the font is really small. Uh, but let me uh, let me see if I can control the speed of this thing here. Um, all right, I just want to stop it and show you what we're doing here. So I've whoops, I have called up. I have I have called up a program that we used previously um, for sending text from the Atmega 328P to a serial monitor on the laptop, and uh, it's a it, it was code called UART string, and it just sent uh, the text. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And so I'm just taking that same code and I'm flashing that to the 328P. And uh, it, all we're going to do is we're just going to see that on the serial monitor here. I just wanted to do that simply to prove that uh, one can um, simply use this device once you have a um, uh, the, the appropriate driver. Uh, you know, I'm using the make file that we are now using uh, in conjunction with the Bear at Mega 328P and the USB Tiny. Um, and uh, here I'm here. Let's see, the code is awfully small, but but there's nothing there's nothing particularly fancy about this. I just wanted to show you sort of as proof that you can go ahead, flash the code we already had using the new make file, and you're going to see strings of data start to show up on the serial monitor pushed out by that bare chip. And so once I get this going here, all right, make it, I, I'm going to flash the code. Okay, I'll open up another window. And this is something we, we've done many times. So um, I just wanted to, you to see it as proof that uh, it, it's, it's, it's all the same procedures to uh, transmit data from the bare chip using this new device. First time I hooked this up and I, and I opened up a screen, that is I opened up a terminal window, it didn't work. And what I did is I had to un I had to disconnect the USB the USB mini connector from the serial USB converter and reconnect it and then it worked that time it worked. Sometimes I find it's necessary for these devices you have to disconnect and then reconnect them. But anyway, here's the result. All that to just get this result. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Okay. Um, so I just wanted you to have that in your toolkit, the ability to uh, pick up that FTDI device, put in a driver, and then have the capability of transmitting serial data uh, via that USB to serial converter uh, so that it can show up on your serial monitor. Okay, so here's the here's the substantive to topic of the day. How does this ultrasound device work? And uh, this is a device that is based on sound echo. And so you all know what sound echo is, you know, intuitively. You you go out, uh, you know, to a point, sometimes a canyon where there are mountains, and you yell, hello, right? And your voice travels out away from you, and it bounces off of a distant object, and then it returns, and you hear the echo later on, right? And so you, you know, you're, you're transmitting. Well, i got to get the pen back here. You're... Uh, when you when you yell hello, right, you're creating a sound wave that's traveling out away from you. And it keeps on traveling out until it impinges on an object like a building or a or a mountain or a wall or whatever. And then the sound wave bounces off that. That's just a you know, that's just a mechanical pressure wave. And it bounces off of that wave and it comes back 
and it tickles your eardrum and you hear the echo, right? And uh, the time delay between when you say hello and when you get the echo is, uh, is just directly proportional to the range and the speed of sound. Now, when we do this, when we, when we create an echo, we're yelling uh, at a frequency uh, that's in the human hearing range. We talked about this before. It's, uh, we, we often think about that as being 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, and it varies as you as you get older, um, but that's that's how we usually characterize the human hearing range. So when we when we do echolocation, we're we're in that range, right? And so if someone, you know, if we if we if, if you're near me and I go out and I scream echo, uh, you're going to hear that echo as as will I, right? Well, um, how fast does sound travel? First of all. And how long does it take for that echo to come back? Well, sound travels uh, pretty slow. It's 343 meters per second, which is 741 miles per hour, or about 1,000 feet per second. So that's the speed of sound. It's, it's, it's roughly 1,000 feet per second, OK? Now, what I'm showing here on this screen is a, is a thunderstorm. And you can see lightning on the right. That's visual, right? That's light. When you see lightning, you are looking at uh, a you know electrical activity that's manifest as a continuum of sparks, right? It's called dielectric breakdown of the air, and you see that as light. Uh, but you also then hear the thunder, right? And it scares the dog, and it can scare you, and it can wake you up at night. And you know that the lightning shows up first, and the thunder shows up next right well that's because the speed of light is so much wicked faster than the speed of sound right speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth right so that's 300 million meters per second right um or uh in feet per second right it's almost a billion feet per second in other words the light for all intents and purposes is instantaneous right it just happens so so quickly we're you know we're not able to really perceive that delay and of course if you're dealing with space travel and, and you know light coming from distant galaxies and things then or, or even you know interplanetary uh, uh distances then of course there's a there's a significant delay and there can be delays in when we send signals up to satellites and down and things like that but for our purposes you know when you think about a thunderstorm um, when there is a bolt of lightning, when there's this phenomenon of, of, of dielectric breakdown, you see the lightning happen almost instantaneously because that light is coming at you so fast. Then the thunder comes at you, the sound of the thunder, right? That's the sound associated with that dielectric breakdown, comes at you much more slowly. It's about a thousand feet per second. That's why there's this rule of thumb. When you see lightning, you start counting. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. And if you then hear the thunder, you could say, okay, it's 4,000 feet away. And that's because the, the sound is traveling at 1,000 feet per second. Okay, I do all this, I tell you all this, just to give you some physical sense of the relatively slow speed that sound uh, moves. Okay, it's a, it's a relatively slow speed of about 1,000 feet per second. And so... Um, uh, mammals, um, like bats and dolphins, use this uh, as a way of seeing, as a way of identifying uh, prey and as a way of navigating. And so they actually use sonar built, you know, built into their heads. Um, and they're doing it at waves that's, that are frequencies above 20 kilohertz. So it's called ultrasonic, ultrasound, meaning it's above 20 kilohertz and we can't see it. Or we can't hear it, I mean. You know, so bats are flying along and they're they're sending out an echo similar to us when we're, you know, bouncing our voice off a, of a canyon and it'll bounce off of prey and it'll come back to them. And they they actually measure the time it takes um, between transmitting and receiving. And that tells them how far away the prey is. And dolphins do the same thing. And uh, in addition to determining how far away the prey is, they also sort of look at the shape of the sound echo and they use that to figure out um, uh, something about the size of the object. 
Uh, so they're just using this principle of, of echolocation that we're talking about here. Ultrasound, because it's above the frequency that, with which we can hear. Okay, So we're going to be doing all this uh, in this last project using the HCSR04, which is a sonar uh, that operates at 40 kilohertz. So it operates at a frequency uh, that we can't hear um, because it's so high, um, but it... Uh, um, it sends out a signal and uh, that signal will come back and it'll take, uh, you know, uh, it would take a, a, a second for a thousand feet uh, to travel. Um, and we could measure the time it takes between transmitting and receiving and use that to figure out how far away an object is. So let's go ahead and look at how this device works. Well, first of all, um, this device has four pins on it, okay? And uh, one pin is VCC, that's five volts. The other one is, is ground. And then it has two other pins, trig, which is the trigger pin, and echo, which is the echo pin. And all the processing is done inside the chip. Um, but, and so we, um, we interact with the chip, well, we give it power, five volts, but we supply this thing with a trigger, and then we get it in return an echo pulse. And, um, it, it, and the echo pulse doesn't work quite the way your intuition might tell you. So let me show you what happens with this. This device has these two these two cans. Each of these are acoustic transducers. So one of them is a transmitter, and it sends out a sound wave. And the other one is a receiver, and it just receives that sound wave. And so let's say that we're, we've got this in front of an object that is at some distance, R. Right? Sometimes we call that a range. Uh, and so the way this device works is we have to, with our computer, we have to give it a trigger. We provide it with a pulse that's five volts tall, you know, a rising edge and then a falling edge. And that pulse has to be 10 microseconds wide. Um, and so we provide it with a 10 microseconds wide that triggers this thing. And then internally, what this thing does is it creates this 40 kilohertz pulse, right? So this is a sine wave. Right, it would, it would, you know, it's, it's a rapidly oscillating signal going from, from, you know, some positive value to a negative value. Right, it's just a, it's a pulse of 40 kilohertz sinusoid uh, that it creates, and the duration of that pulse is sort of not our business. That's internal to this device. But what happens is that pulse travels out away from the transmitter, and it travels out into space, and, and very much analogous to us saying hello in a canyon or to the bat or the dolphin. And then what happens is it bounces off of an object, right? It encounters an object and it bounces back, okay? And I mean, it actually scatters off of the object, meaning that the energy, that the sound energy, uh, this pressure wave is, is, is sort of reflected in a, or scattered in a lot of different directions. But what matters is the amount of that pulse that is, that is traveled back and picked up by the receiver. And so what happens is sometime later, depending on how far away the target is, a weaker version of that same pulse shows up at the receiver. Okay, how far away? I mean, how, how, how much time does it take between when you transmit and when receive? Well, the pulse is going out at the speed of sound, 343 meters per second, or 34,300 centimeters per second. Okay, so what happens is that receive waveform um, then uh, cause, uh, results in this device, the device spits out a pulse that we can monitor and it's called the echo pulse. It's, it's, so I, it's a little confusing because this is, this is actually the, the echo pulse. But the way this device has been built is there's a pulse that we monitor, this echo pin here. And what the echo pin does is it, it creates a pulse and that pulse goes high when the transmit waveform goes out, and then that pulse goes low when the received waveform comes back, okay? So that the width of that pulse, the, the, the width of this pulse that we monitor is the time difference between transmitting and receiving the ultrasound pulse. And so the width is gonna be the range of the distance divided by the velocity and the distance is two times r because it's round trip travel so the width of that pulse is two times r divided by the speed of sound so the way it works is we provide a trigger 
and then we measure the width or the duration of that echo pulse. And the duration of that echo pulse will give us directly the target range. So let me sort of break this down again. We start out, we provide a 10 microsecond wide five volt pulse to the trigger pin on this sensor. We provide it to this pin right here, okay? And then the device internally will send out a 40 kilohertz burst of sound. And that will bounce off the target and it'll return to the to this to the receiver a time delay later. What's the time delay? It's the distance divided by the speed of sound. The distance is is this round trip, right? So if the object is R meters away, the distance is 2R. And so a pulse then gets generated, and it's going to have a width t is equal to 2 times r divided by v sub s. We measure the width of that pulse. We know the speed of sound. So then we can easily obtain r from that. OK? So that's how this works. All we need to do, we power up this device with 5 volts and ground. We provided a trigger pulse. And then we monitor this echo, and we just look at the width of the echo pulse. And we're, we're interested in how long and the duration of this pulse and when it rises and then when it falls. OK, so our job is to measure that. Now, how can we do that? How can we measure the duration of a pulse? Well, let's suppose that we have that that echo and let's suppose it's connected to um, PB1, for example, it's just one of our GPIO pins. Right. And all we want to know is what is the width of that? OK. What's the duration of that? Uh, you know, it's a, this is a function of time here, right? And we want to know what is its duration. Because if we know the duration, we know the distance to our object, okay? Because we know the speed of sound, all right? So how are we going to do it? Well, we've been dealing with counters for a little while now. We're going to start a timer counting. And when we start a timer, what that means, it's ticking away, right? And we're going we're gonna to have specified the... Uh, the you know, how fast that timer is counting. So we know for every beat of the clock, for every clock cycle, we know how much time elapses. So we're going to get a timer to start counting. We're going to wait for pin PB1 to go high. That is, we're looking for this rising edge. We wait for that to go high. Um, and then when it goes high, we just take note how many, when, how many clock cycles have elapsed uh, for between when we started the timer and when it goes high. Then we'll wait for it to go low. We're waiting for this to happen. We note how many clock cycles have elapsed between when we started the timer and that falling edge. And then we just take the difference between the time to the falling edge minus the time to the rising edge. And that's going to give us the width of our pulse. OK, so this is, you know, this is not real code. This is sort of very pseudo code. But let me show you how we can take this and that previous drawing and turn this into code. So, so we have a we have two pins that we have to worry about. A pin here called trig, okay, and I'm calling this one trig. And then we have another pin called echo, right? And that's going to be this one down here. So we have to first provide a 10. Uh, microsecond pulse to trigger the ultrasound sensor. And I put that down here. So this would be code that will provide a clean 10 microsecond pulse. What is this code doing? Um, well, I would I will I will have needed to um, do some defines up here. I define uh, trig to be PB0 and then echo to be PB1. So I'll be using two pins from port B. I could use any pins I want. But let's suppose that I chose to use PB0 as our trig pin, meaning it's it's wired to this pin here. And then I use PB1 wired to echo pin. Okay. Um, so this line here, okay, what that's going to do is it's going to, uh, 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 what I need to do is create a 10 microsecond pulse, meaning I have to have, I have to be low. This line has to be low. Then I have to make it go high, stay high for 10 microseconds, and then bring it low again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by making this thing low. That's what this is going to do, right? You, you, you recognize this. That brings, this will cause PB0 to go low. And then I'm just waiting a little bit. I'm just waiting five microseconds, right? I bring it low. I wait five microseconds. 
Then I'm going to bring it high, wait 10 microseconds, and then bring it low. Okay. Uh, now, the first part of this I may not need, but I just decided, you know, when I come across this pole, this line, this PB, PB0 line, I don't know whether it's high or low. So I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make it go low. Right. And what I need is to create a positive going uh, five microsecond pulse. So I bring it low. I just wait a little bit. Then I go high. I wait 10 microseconds. We haven't actually used this function before. We've always used delay millisecond, but there's also a delay microsecond. So we, so that'll just, uh, uh, you know, that'll just give us a, de, uh, a go. I go high, right? That's this rising edge. I wait 10 microseconds and then I bring it low. Okay, and that's what's happening here. So that, that little block of code accomplishes the triggering. Then all of this happens inside the the ultrasound device. We don't have to worry about that. We just have to do this next. I have to measure the duration of that echo pulse. So that's what this code is down here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to I want to know when that goes high. Okay. So I'm just waiting. I'm polling the echo pin to see when it goes high. And when it goes high, I'm um, I'm just noting the position of the clock. We will have previously set up a clock, and it's going to be free running. And I'm just going to note the position of that clock, right? How many clock cycles have gone by? And that tells me uh, sort of the time associated with this rising edge. Then I'll wait for it to go low, meaning I'm waiting for that falling edge. I note the time to the falling edge. And then I just do a subtraction. I, do, I subtract the time to the falling edge minus the time to the rising edge, and that gives me the pulse width. It's, it's actually not the width in seconds, but it's the width in the number of clock cycles that have elapsed. Then this next line here converts that from uh, pulse width to range, and that'll give me the range to the target. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing here is showing you, this is still, think about this as pseudocode. I mean, this is a step between um, the real code I'm going to use and pseudocode, but um, the actual code is going to be slightly different from this. I just wanted to sort of sketch out what the actual function should look like. Um, I know I have to initialize the timer, so I put a timer init here, and I'm going to use a function down here to initialize the timer. And before I measure this pulse width, I want to reset the timer to zero. So that's sort of the complete code. Oh, once I've got, once I figure out the range, I want to send it to the serial monitor. So I'm just going to do that as a function. So this is still pseudocode like. Uh, next, oh, I have to, just to complete this thing, I've got to give, uh, I have to declare the variables I'm using, and I have to create a while loop. So I'm sort of, I'm sort of working my way up. Uh, you know, what's what are the critical functions, and then how do I get a complete piece of code out of this? And here's what it looks like. And so. Um, uh, this this whole code occupies one, you know, sort of two, uh, three different slides. I also show you the make file that I used to uh, to build it. That means to compile it and then upload it. Um, and let me just sort of walk you through sort of the timing math here. I'm going to walk you through this, and I have all that as a comment. So this code operates the uh, the HCSR04 ultrasound sensor and displays measured range on a serial monitor via UART. Okay, so the code provides a 10 microsecond trigger pulse on PB1, then waits for an echo pulse on PB0. Uh, the duration of the echo pulse is the round trip time delay to the target. Now it's the next lines that are kind of important because they set up the timing. My system clock is 16 megahertz. I'm using in the clock a, a 1024 divider. So that means that the clock that's actually operating the timer is 16 megahertz divided by 1024, which is 15.625 kilohertz. What that means is this timer that I've got counting up in normal mode, each tick tock of that is one divided by 15,625. So each each time it goes tick tock, 64 microseconds have elapsed. So every every time my timer, I'm using timer zero. Every time it ticks, it, it goes up one. 64 microseconds has elapsed. 
So I have to figure out what does 64 microseconds represent in round trip, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sound travel. Well, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second or 34,300 centimeters per second. So I want to be thinking in centimeters, not meters for this for this application. So each clock pulse, each of those pulses is going to be I want to I want to find out what different distance it represents. So it's 34,300 centimeters per second times 64 microseconds per clock pulse. That works out to 2.195 centimeters round trip or 1.098 centimeters one way, roughly one centimeter so each each of those clock pulses is, a, is approximately one centimeter so that's kind of convenient okay the rest of the code just sort of implements all of this and i i won't go through that here you've got it there to study and to look at um, what i'm going to do is just show you what the thing looks like uh, and then show you a, a a demo of it so here's the system um, I'm I'm running this, uh, you know, I'm programming it and powering it with the pocket programmer, and then I'm going to be, you know, I'll be triggering this thing. It'll it'll be, you know, operating as we just described. I'll be um, measuring the the width of that pulse. I'll be converting that to range, and then I'm going to be sending that range um, via the the TXD, the transmit data line, right, into this serial to USB converter, and I'm reading that via my terminal. Okay, um, so here's a little video, um, and you're, you're going to see, let, let me, let's see if I pause this and, and explain it to you. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm kind of looking downrange. Uh, I've got the I've got this the the sensor in the foreground. It's a little blurry, so I've got my focus kind of set in the background. And you'll see me moving my hand and other things back and forth. Take a look at the display here. Okay, um, it's it shows rising edge is eight, falling edge is fifteen. So that's the time to the rising edge of that echo pulse is eight. It's eight tick tocks or eight clock pulses. That is, um, I'm looking at the value of this clock, right? And the, the rising edge is occurring at eight. The falling edge is at 15. That means that the echo pulse width was seven clock pulses. Seven clock pulses, and it's 1.098 centimeters per pulse. That tells me that the target range is eight centimeters or three inches. So I just keep running this thing. Okay, so now I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to let it run. And you'll see me moving my hand back and forth to, you know, two inches right up close. All right, then I'll go start moving it away. Four, five, seven, I'm going to stop it for a minute. Um, behind my hand is a is a wall with some built in bookcases. So that's a little bit of a complicated background. When I get out a tape measure, the distance between the sonar and the closest point on that wall is 64 inches. So sometimes you'll see the number 64 popping up. Sometimes it'll be uh, a number larger than that as it's getting an echo from something deeper in that wall. Okay, but let's go ahead and run it. Move my hand away, 10 inches, 11 inches, 14, 16, 18. Okay, 69, it saw the wall instead of me. Now it's 66, 65, it's measuring that wall, okay? Now I bring the great spooky pumpkin into the picture. Okay, 18, 16, uh, 13. Sometimes it's seeing the wall. Sometimes it's seeing the pumpkin. Okay, I'm going to stop it right here. Um, one of my daughters, uh, e even though she's in graduate school, has an extensive collection of, uh, of ugly dolls. Uh, and um, I wanted to use one of those things instead of the great pumpkin, but I actually couldn't get an echo from it because the sound was traveling right through it. You'll find when you're measuring something, something like your hand that has all that blood and fat in it does a good job reflecting. Uh, this pumpkin is made out of heavy plastic, so that does a good, re good job reflecting. But if you put a pillow or something light, the sound might travel right through it. And you'll find uh, different objects are going to have different abilities to reflect. You'll also find that 
here I, I'm showing the, the pumpkin kind of off to the side. And if you look at the display, sometimes you're getting an echo from the pumpkin, but sometimes it's from the wall itself. So you'll find sometimes this the, the, the display can be a little wonky because it's looking at, at, at all kinds of things in the background, right? Okay, uh, 18 inches back to the pumpkin, sometimes the wall, 21 inches, pumpkin's moving farther out. Okay, so that's it. Um, so you know what, folks? That's all I wanted to show you. I, I didn't want to uh, kind of crowd the brains with too much today. Um, I wanted to illustrate how this sonar works. It's not that tricky once you get into it. We, we're just triggering it and measuring the duration of the echo pulse. We're using a simple normal mode up counting timer to do that. Uh, so it's a good it's a it's a good use of the timer. Um, you know, um, be, between what you're doing in an assignment four, where you're using pulse width modulation, and where we're doing this, you're you're seeing th these timers. They sound a little complicated the first time you see them, but when you start to use them, they're they're actually pretty simple. You just have to sort of set set a couple of registers the right way, and then these timers can be pretty useful for you. Um, okay. That's all I'm going to say today about this, unless you have any questions or comments. There was a question in the chat uh, earlier on. Okay, yeah, so I see two, quest two questions. Can we make a, the LED have a certain brightness, depending on how close an object is, um, using when you say duty cycle stuff, I presume you mean pulse width modulation. So here you're referring to lab five. I mean, if you, you're not required to, but you can, you know, you can, in addition to using the OLED display, which is a requirement, you can optionally add an LED where you're changing the brightness or you're changing the blink rate in relation to distance. Um, sure, feel free to do that uh, if you wish. And then when will labs three and four be graded? We're grading lab three right now. Uh, and so we'll get that back to you as soon as we can. Um, uh, I mean, I, I guess I understand the question. I think I think I understand the question behind. Will labs three and four be graded in time for you to know how you did so that you can decide whether or not to do lab five? Um, I get it. Um, We'll try. I had another question for the professor. Okay, go ahead. Um, well, it's not a question about um, this lab. I actually had a 